Okay, well, uh, thank you for um, having me. Um, I want to talk, as you'll see in the PowerPoint, PowerPoint. about uh, uh, blasphemy and its role in the modern world. And I um, want to emphasize that sometimes that's seen as a very uh, narrow topic. Um, but I, I think it's a fundamental one, particularly in the Muslim majority world, um, that doing research on a variety of things, I um, learned that this was a, um, a barrier to uh, the realization of uh, other human rights. So began uh, working on this um, about 16, 17 years ago, uh, more systematically. Now the subject has uh, taken off. And in fact, there's a last week a statement by um, I think at least twelve governments are calling for the repeal of blasphemy laws uh, worldwide. But anyway, let's let's get into this. Uh, um, Melissa, do I have to ask you to advance the thing, or can I? Hello. Sorry, for some reason, whenever I was trying to click me, unmute, it was not allowing me to. Um, so let me reshare. So you can just tell me, yes, just let me know when you need me to advance it. Okay, and let's, and let's go so. next okay. slide. Okay, perfect. So here we go. Let me actually see if it works for me. Um, yeah, it does. Oh, the, or did it? I think I actually did that one. So that's okay. Okay, I will when. carry on. Um, okay. Just, uh, uh, most of us will be aware that um, uh, Salman Rushdie um, on August 12th of this year in New York State um, was stabbed uh, by a man who believed that Rushdie's famous 1988 novel, The Satanic Verses, was blasphemous. And you may remember that uh, the uh, late Ayatollah Khomeini um, issued a fatwa condemning the book and said it was the duty of every Muslim to kill uh, Rashti. And um, that was 32 years ago. And uh, uh, people are still trying to carry out that uh, death threat. Next. Another recent one, um, The uh, this, this was two years back, Patti, a French teacher, um, he had a class on, on freedom of speech in, uh, this is a high school class, and he showed to the class, he gave advance warning and says, if anybody feels uncomfortable uh, seeing these, you can be, you can you know, leave the room, whatever, there's no penalty, you know, uh, it won't affect your class status. And then showed some of the milder cartoons from, um, uh, Charlie Hebdo. Anyway, the, uh, he was beheaded um, in the street uh, on the grounds that having shown some of those cartoons was blasphemous. So there's a couple of recent incidents. It's still ongoing. Next. Um, uh, when this hits the news, as, as in these two cases, uh, they got international coverage but they're quickly forgotten. And um, I also want to argue that they are atypical. They are unusual incidents. There are thousands. In fact, I will argue that there are several million victims of uh, <laughs> blasphemy restrictions, uh, but we often forget them. Next. Uh, Melissa and uh, Megan mentioned earlier a book I co-authored uh, called Silence. Uh, which came out now about 10 years ago. Uh, I may add that Oxford University Press has now put this book on the web for free. So uh, uh, if you want to look at that, it's, it's now freely available. But it, it's quite a big book. We covered 46 countries uh, in the West, in the Muslim majority world. And um, we looked at thousands of cases so what I'm going, most of what I'm going to do in my presentation is summarize our general findings about what's going on in the world. Next. 
Uh, firstly, restrictions on blasphemy are uh, widespread in the world. I've, as I said, I'll be talking mainly about the Muslim majority world, but they're not restricted to that. Here's a couple of examples. Uh, the Netherlands, uh, actually it's just repealed that. Uh, Germany, Poland, Russia, India, Sri Lanka, uh, both have um, a blasphemy laws or the functional equivalent. Next. Uh, and uh, following on from that diagram, it, the Russians have actually used this, the Poles have, uh, the Germans. And in the other countries I mentioned, not only do they have such laws, but in the last few decades, they have been um, used. Usually in the West, the uh, penalties have been pretty light. Next. Uh, they are widespread still in Europe, but in most cases are not used. So if, if you look at a list of countries which have laws penalizing, say, defamation of religion or insulting religion or blasphemy, I'll use all those terms to mean more or less the same thing. Uh, if, if you look at countries which actually have them, that can be misleading because lots of European countries do. Um, but in the vast majority of cases in the West, they are not used. In the United Kingdom, for example, um, it's had a blasphemy law which um, forbade insulting the Church of England, by the way. Um, you could insult any other religion. You could insult Methodists. You could insult Presbyterians, but you weren't allowed to insult the Church of England. Uh, but that law hasn't been used for sort of over 80 years. And so that has led to its repeal. Next. If we focus on uh, cases where the laws are actually used, where people are um, prosecuted and imprisoned or killed for blasphemy, and if we look at uh, more widespread private attacks, that is, the state will do things, but a much greater danger if you're accused of blasphemy is an attack by terrorists or by mobs. Uh, they are now much more prevalent in the Muslim majority world, especially the greater Middle East. And by the greater Middle East, I mean the areas within that red circle that you can see. There are examples outside of there. You get them in Bangladesh as well. You get them in Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, but 90% uh, plus of the active cases in the world are occurring within that red circle. Next. There is obviously tremendous variation. Uh, each country has its uh, own idiosyncrasies, but I will say there are five recurring patterns of blasphemy restrictions. Next. First. Um, the events that tend to get the most attention, two I've mentioned, the beheading of Samuel Patti, the stabbing of uh, Salman Rushdie, but also the attacks on the French uh, satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo, uh, you, the editorial staff was massacred in Paris a couple of years ago, or the American pastor Terry Jones who threatened to burn a Koran or back in 2005, what we'll call the Danish uh, cartoons in the Danish newspaper, the island post. Um, all these got international attention. And if you talk about uh, restrictions on blasphemy, if people are aware of them at all, it's usually these uh, incidents which uh, people are aware of. Note all the ones I have listed occur in the West, that is in, uh, so far in the North, North America and Europe. So these are the ones which get the most attention, but next. Uh, the second general point, and I'll go back to this, the actual accusations are very varied and usually they're very vague. So that uh, 
I've already used the expression insulting uh, religion and, uh, as a synonym for blasphemy. There are many others. The terms uh, can vary quite widely. Next. Here's a partial list of terms um, which for which people have been prosecuted. A lot of these occur in Iran. One is insulting Islam. Um, another thing has been imitating Christians or friendship with the enemies of God or enmity to the friends of God. Insulting a heavenly religion. Uh, that's the um, Article 96F of the Egyptian uh, penal code. Creating confusion among Muslims. You get that in um, Malaysia. And um, many others, the list is 50 or 60 incidents long. And uh, it's not clear, uh, many of these things are very vague terms which can be used to uh, attack and imprison almost um, anybody. I'm gonna use next the term blasphemy as a proxy term for um, all of these. Next. So first, the, the, the ones which get attention in the West, second, the charges are vague. And third, these types of accusations are often shaped by political manipulation. Next. So for example, uh, the so-called Danish cartoon of, uh, I'm getting old, so I, you know, I remember this very well, but um, uh, uh, in case you wouldn't remember, the Danish cartoon published, uh, Danish newspaper published four, 14 cartoons uh, concerning Muhammad. Uh, most did not have any representation of Muhammad at all. One of them is simply a, a cartoon of a cartoonist making a cartoon while looking over his shoulder nervously and things of this kind. Um, but if you ask people who remember this, this you say, what happened? They said, this Danish cartoon published, um, Danish newspaper, sorry, I told you my brain was still halfway from Indonesia. Uh, the newspaper published these cartoons and people say, well, then there were riots in Afghanistan, people were killed in Nigeria, more riots in, in uh, Pakistan, uh, boycotts from Turkey and uh, Egypt and so on. And um, all those things happened, but they did not happen when the cartoons came out. When those cartoons were published in September 2005, there was very little reaction at all. There was condemnation. There were peaceful protests by Muslims in Denmark. It was only almost six months later, after the organization of the Islamic Conference had its meeting in Saudi Arabia and decided to make an issue of it, uh, that these things blew up. So it, it, that became a larger issue uh, because certain governments wanted to make it an issue. There were later, uh, in my view, much more offensive cartoons published in Sweden on two different occasions. And they drew almost no protest, nor did the uh, Dutch politician Geert Wilders film Fitna. Uh, people were worried there was going to be a lot of outrage over that. Again, almost nothing. Uh, the uh, response or riots or attacks uh, are usually very politically conditioned. They're usually yeah. not just a spontaneous eruption. Next. Uh, and that's just what I said. Uh, let me be careful here. Um, I am not saying, as many people do these days, people will say, oh, that's politics, not religion. Um, well, the fact that something is political doesn't mean it's not religious. That's like saying, that table is not red, it's round. I said, well, you can have a round red table and you can have a political uh, thing. I mean, the... Um, say the Christian Democratic Party, and uh, in Germany, it's been the ruling party and major party in Germany for last several decades, uh, defines itself as Christian Democratic. 
the Christian Democratic, what was called the Christian Democratic International, a gathering of political parties, was the, is the largest gathering of political parties in the world. And um, usually politics and religion are intertwined. So when I say it's a result of political manipulation, um, I'm not saying it's not religious. Another way of putting this is this, unless people feel religiously insulted, you can't politically manipulate them. You can't manipulate religion unless religion's important to people, otherwise they don't care. So uh, do not say that something is politics, not religion. When I say the, this political manipulation, it's political manipulation of religious sentiment, and they go together. So charges of blasphemy can put to very cynical use, and I can give many examples. Next. Fourth, uh, while governments can be very bad um, on this, you know, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Iran, Pakistan, um, Afghanistan, even Turkey uh, these days, now recently in Libya, um, uh, can be a great danger that is in uh, prosecuting and um, imprisoning uh, people who are accused of blasphemy. The big danger is not from government, but from society. For mob attacks, you're accused of blasphemy and a mob comes and kills you or vigilantes and terrorists. Next. So to give an example of this, Pakistan has perhaps the most developed blasphemy laws in the world. And has three different blasphemy laws, all of which now can carry the death penalty. But in the modern era, in the last 30 or 40 years, nobody in Pakistan has actually been executed under the blasphemy laws. Hundreds of people charged, but nobody executed. However, hundreds of people have died because when they've been accused of um, blasphemy, they've been attacked by mobs who uh, have simply killed them. They've been killed in prison. Uh, they've been uh, killed um, while in police stations. But mobs and terrorists will focus on them next. And the, the fifth uh, major point, uh, most of the accusations are not against Western cartoonists, such as in Sweden or Denmark or uh, the Netherlands or France or in the United States. Um, at least one uh, cartoonist has got in the United States has gone into the witness, equivalent of the witness protection program because of um, her cartoons. Uh, so this happens, but most of the accusations are not against uh, Westerners. Most occur in the Muslim majority world and are very often accusations against Muslims. Uh, most of the people accused of blasphemy are probably, depending on how you define them, Muslims, especially minorities and um, more sort of moderate or liberal, there's no good word, uh, I'll just say uh, moderate Muslims. So those are uh, five major patterns. Next. Um, continuing this, who are the major victims of a blasphemy law? This is continuing my fifth point, they're mainly not Westerners. Uh, there are four major sets of people who tend to be targeted by uh, blasphemy accusations. One is, and again, it's like the term moderate Muslim, um, which is not a good term because you know a Muslim will respond, says, you know, because I, I, you know, I'm not a moderate, I'm a fully convinced fanatic Muslim. I just don't believe in killing people and I believe in getting on with people, but uh, there's no good term. So I'll use the term moderate, and here the term post-Islamic religion. Um, and these are the Baha'is, they're spread throughout the world, but the largest concentration is in um, Iran. And Ahmadis or Ahmadiyya, 
again, spread throughout the world, uh, but with the largest population in, um, in Pakistan. And for the Ahmadis, at least, uh, they would regard themselves as Muslim, though uh, it's illegal for them. In Pakistan, it's illegal for an Ahmadi to refer to themselves as a Muslim. So that's one category. These are religions which have appeared in the Muslim majority world, and they're castigated on the grounds that they have uh, claimed that there is a, a, a prophet who has appeared after the uh, Muslim prophet Muhammad. So they're, they're seen as heretical and therefore uh, damaging Islam. A second category is actual converts, uh, apostates, unbelievers. That is a Muslim who becomes a Christian or perhaps an atheist, um, uh, or in some cases in Iran, a Zoroastrian. Most converts tend to be to from Islam tend to be to Christianity, but there are some other uh, uh, people too. So they may be uh, accused of apostasy. Uh, thirdly, uh, Muslim minorities. That is, if you are Sunni, or Shi if you are Sunni, say in um, Iran, or you are Shia in uh, Indonesia, um, or Egypt, or Saudi Arabia, um, or if you are a Sufi, a more spiritual oriented and a mystical uh, form of Islam if in Iran, um, you may be persecuted. Um, by a majority form of Islam in the area in which you are. And the fourth uh, category is Muslim religious and political reformers and dissidents. That is uh, Muslims who challenge reactionary forms of Islam <clears throat> or um, who challenge reactionary and authoritarian governments. They are um, often accused of some form of blasphemy. So those are the, the four basic categories of uh, who tends to get accused in the world. Next. First, uh, just a comment on those post-Islamic beliefs, the Baha'is and uh, Ahmadis. Next. Uh, so just some examples. Um, these were seven principal Baha'i leaders um, in Iran. They were arrested in 2008, imprisoned in 2010, and um, <clears throat> they're not due for release until uh, 2028. Um, also, Baha'is have no legal status in um, Iran. Therefore, there is no penalty for killing a Baha'i. Next. Uh, just one example of Baha'is, <clears throat> then what I'm calling actual apostates, people who have left Islam and they'll say themselves, yes, I've done that, I'm, I'm now a Christian or I'm now an atheist. Next. So again, just uh, some examples. Um, uh, three uh, Christians uh, sentenced um, in Iran for 10 years of imprisonment for uh, evangelism, uh, that's what it, they're in fact prison, in prison for, that's what they were doing, but they were, uh, the, accusation, the accusation was uh, something else. That was in 2018. And um, in Iran, as many of you will probably know, uh, there's a major crackdown on the um, Farsi speaking churches that the Farsi being the majority religion in um, language in um, Iran. Um, in Iran, you, you have uh, various types of Christians. You have, I'll call them traditional religions, um, Armenians, Syriacs, and others. And um, they are generally, they're born Christian, their families, they're traditional Christians. They're, they've been there for, thousands of years. And um, they're second class citizens, but they're not actively persecuted. But the Farsi speaking churches um, are generally um, 
people populated by ex-Muslims, and that is why the government is cracking down on them uh, for apostasy. And those churches are growing rapidly. The government is so unpopular um, that uh, it's turning many people uh, away from um, Islam. And uh, that's one reason churches in Iran are growing so quickly. Next. Um, often victims are falsely or mistakenly accused. Next. Um, so uh, this Shabazz Bati um, killed several years ago. He was the highest ranking Christian in the government of Pakistan. He was, in fact, appointed the minister um, for um, my religious minority affairs. And uh, he was killed. He was shot to death, not for blaspheming in any normal sense of that word, but for opposing the blasphemy law. They're just saying, this is a bad law. We should repeal it. So some fanatics thought it was blasphemous to suggest repealing the blasphemy law. And um, so he was killed. Next. Uh, another example um, of someone falsely accused, um, Ahok, that's the man on the left, not to be confused with the man on the right. Um, he, he was the uh, uh, governor of Jakarta, the, the capital of uh, Indonesia, and was falsely accused of uh, blasphemy because someone doctored a, um, a YouTube video and altered his remarks. Um, and in fact, the person who did that was convicted of that crime and, and sentenced to prison. However, Ahok himself was still sentenced to two years for um, his alleged blasphemy. Uh, Indonesia is a fascinating country. Uh, Ahok was indeed in prison, um, though not in very onerous conditions. I was able to visit him in prison. Um, and as a friend of the president, now he's head of the National Oil Company in Indonesia. He was appointed that a couple of months after he got out of prison. So next. Uh, so there's the um, the sort of Baha'is, uh, Ahmadiyya, then the carry of converts, apostates, and then the third one I'd mentioned, Muslims of, quote, the wrong type in the wrong place. Uh, they could be Sunni or Shia or Sufi. Next. So, for example, um, in Iran, uh, the government has uh, cracked down on um, Sufis. Many of the they're some of the most heavily persecuted people within uh, um, Iran, and um, have demonstrated against their repression. And uh, uh, as it usually does, the Iranian government has cracked down violently against such demonstrations. Next. Then my fourth category of victims would be Muslim religious and political reformers and dissidents. I'm going to talk more about them because I, I think they are key to other disputes about the Muslim world. Next. Uh, because the term uh, terms blasphemy or insulting religion or insulting uh, Muslims or uh, supporting liberal Islam, because these terms are so vague, they are used to suppress debate, dissent, and renewal within the Muslim world. They are a major barrier to many things. Next. Um, the uh, Afghani magazine editor, Ali Mohakek Nassab, it was his case which um, started for me to focus on the blasphemy issue. He was a magazine editor. And uh, in about 2005, uh, there was a famous case in Afghanistan of a uh, Afghan Christian who was discovered to have been previously Muslim. And there was a big push for him to be executed. Um, this even came before the... Um, 
uh, the the parliament in um, Afghanistan, and they passed a resolution saying uh, he should be killed. We're talking about the Christian now. In the midst of this, um, Ali, who is the editor of the magazine, he's holding two copies. Uh, the magazine, by the way, translates as, as women's rights. And he published two articles. He didn't write the articles. He published them. Uh, one saying, should we really um, execute people for apostasy? And another article is, should we, ex should we really execute people for adultery? And so bear in mind, these were articles, serious articles, raising questions, not saying blasphemy is okay or whatever. It's just, but should we be executing or imprisoning people for that? Next. So uh, uh, I'll just finish with Ali. So Ali himself was sentenced to two years imprisonment for publishing an article um, asking about changing the blasphemy laws and asking about adultery. So note that for simply raising these questions, he's accused of blasphemy. So if you want to so have changes in Pakistan, even more difficult now with um, the Taliban back, but if you want changes there or in Iran or Egypt uh, or Pakistan or Yemen, um, then you need to be allowed to debate these things. You can say, you know, what should be the penalty for adultery? Or should we really allow child marriage? Or are our divorce for Muslim males, is it too lenient? If you raise these questions, you can be accused of blasphemy, which means in many of these settings, these questions cannot be raised so that actual debate and discussion within Islam is stifled by these laws so that you cannot uh, deal properly with reform of the criminal justice system or many other features because if you raise these questions you may be accused of blasphemy sometimes by the government uh, but often by radicals who will simply um, kill you as they've done for Egyptian reformers, Bangladeshi reformers, and others. Um, one other example, uh, Mohsen Kadavar, um, an uh, um, Iranian scholar, uh, very convinced Muslim. And um, uh, his crime, I put crime in quotation marks, was um, a, a, a three volume work entitled the theory of the state in Shiite jurisprudence. Okay, you won't find that on your supermarket shelves. It's a, um, a, a very dense and thoughtfully argued book, which says the dominant political ideas in Iran held by the late Khomeini and now the current ruler Khamenei, whereby the actual Islamic jurists rule the country he says that's a deviation from Shia Islam. So he raises a serious discussion in a three volume work, and he's accused of sort of deviationism, of insulting Islam, because the government says it's Islamic. So if you criticize us, you're criticizing Islam. So you're a blasphemer. And uh, Kadivar himself uh, faced prison charges and had to flee. Next. So, so you have Muslims, you know, two examples there, one from Iran, more from Afghanistan, uh, that you can't raise certain questions, you can't debate uh, because you're gonna be accused of uh, insulting religion. This also applies to uh, Muslims in the West as well as non-Muslims like Rushdie. Um, next. So we could give many examples. Uh, but uh, Ikin Delagos, the first Muslim MP in Germany, has had to travel with bodyguards because she cri has criticized the status of um, women in many uh, Muslim communities within, uh, within Germany. 
And so she has been threatened, not by the government, of course, uh, but again, by, by radicals who say she's insulting Islam. And there are many other examples of uh, Muslim politicians in the West who face these threats. Next. Uh, not only Muslims, but some other examples, which we've alluded to. Next. So we've mentioned um, the uh, uh, Danish cartoons. We've mentioned Rusty. Uh, we mentioned Samuel Patti. Um, but this is from the uh, Al-Qaeda magazine, Inspire, and ISIS, the Islamic State, has published um, certain things. Uh, this is from the, the online um, website, uh, listing various people who are, um, you know, as it says, the top right, wanted, dead or alive. Um, or as it says in the middle of the West, a bullet a day keeps the infidel away. So it's listing Terry Jones, who threatened to uh, burn a Koran next to him, Karsten Hust, uh, Kurt Vestergaard, the Swedish cartoons, Kurt Wilders, um, Dutch politician, Lars Vilks, another Swedish uh, cartoonist, uh, French professor, Stephanie Charbon, Fleming Rose, um, who was the culture editor of Yale and Post in the Danish um, newspaper, and others in the West, including we see um, Salman Rushdie, and then Ayan Hersey Ali, whom you'd know, and then uh, Molly Norris, who I mentioned, an American cartoonist, seems to be forgotten about Americans. Uh, she was told by the FBI her life was in danger because of some of her cartoons. She'd actually call, called for, uh, let, let's all make a cartoon of Muhammad Day. And she's given up her job, changed her name, and she's in hiding. This is a, a journalist um, who could no longer write and who could, who could no longer reveal herself in the United States. Next. Um, I've given a very fleeting, as I say, there are so many such examples um, of people who've been uh, directly attacked or if not attacked, have been threatened. And so they have to live with bodyguards or live in, in, in hiding. But of course, the wider effect is not on uh, the people who are directly attacked, but on everybody else. The result is self-censorship. People no longer say things through fear. So if um, you're living in Iran, and uh, you decide you're not going to write your seriously Islamic jurisprudential book differing from the government. That's too dangerous. Or in Egypt, um, you are not going to write the, that type of novel anymore. Or in Saudi Arabia, you will not raise questions about uh, restrictions on um, on women or restrictions on Shia. Um, so people, you just no longer raise these questions. This is also true in the West. Uh, often Westerners will say, well, we don't say certain things about Islam or we don't publish certain cartoons out of respect. Um, but in most cases, I think they're waffling. They uh, don't do it because they're scared and often have reason to be scared. Next. So just one small example. Um, uh, the New York Times in 2014 wrote an article about a statue of Islam's prophet Muhammad that until 1955 had been on the roof of the courthouse at Madison Avenue and 25th Street in New York. So the New York Times wrote an article about this statue uh, but refused to show a photograph of the statue itself. Strange thing. Uh, meanwhile, next. Uh, meanwhile, I'll just mention this as an aside. Um, on the US Supreme Court, that's not a great photograph, it's stretched too high, but um, on the Supreme Court building in Washington, DC, 
if you look on the frieze at the top within that triangle there, you will see a list, a, a carvings of major lawgivers in the world, and one of them is Muhammad. So there's actually now a statue of Muhammad on the US Supreme Court building um, in, in Washington, DC, shown as a, a uh, lawgiver. Uh, he stands between Charlemagne and Justinian, and up there with Hugo Grotius, William Blackstone, and John Marshall next. That again is a close-up um, with uh, Charlemagne and uh, Muhammad there in the middle, currently there. Next, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, a major dip, uh, danger. Um, the reason it got me into this is the suppression of debate and renewal with Islam itself because you may charge with blasphemy for raising questions. Next. Some examples um, of this, I mentioned Mosin Kadova before, um, but another example is uh, Salman Tazir, a Muslim. He was the governor of Punjab, the largest province in Pakistan. It embraces about half the country. It was uh, You may remember the case of Asia Bibi, a Christian woman who was on death row for many years, accused of uh, blasphemy. Um, um, he defended her and he opposed the blasphemy law. And so he was killed by one of his um, bodyguards. And as his, his daughter uh, says, this is a warning to every liberal by which she means uh, people who don't hold to a reactionary form of Islam, not liberal in the Western said, warning to every liberal, shut up or be shot. By the way, very unusually, the man who killed Salman Tazir, one of his bodyguards, uh, was in fact charged with murder and was convicted. Uh, this was unusual that uh, someone who killed someone who was accused of blasphemy would themselves be tried. Um, and was in fact executed is very unusual. But of course, the judge in the case had to flee Pakistan because he was accused of blasphemy for having convicted a person who murdered someone accused of blasphemy. And if you defend that judge, you may be accused of blasphemy. This reminds me very much of the old Monty Python skit in the life of Brian, um, that um, someone was um, accused of blasphemy and the Roman centurion asked, well, what did, he, what did he say? He says, well, I can't tell you that. But he whispered in his ear and was then stoned for blasphemy. Anyway, next. Uh, but this question of, again, now focusing on the question of debate, is a danger, again, not only in the Muslim-majority world, but throughout the world, including the West. Next. Uh, Rushdie himself said uh, last year um, that uh, the Western world has changed. That in uh, when his he was the first fatwa was issued against him, calling for his death in 1990. People defended him. He appeared with politicians throughout the world, and was a, a major figure. People resisted that, uh, but he said things have now changed. And he said the kinds of people who stood up for me in the bad years that is in the early years when he had to live in hiding, might not do so now. And you will have the sentiment uh, much more now that, well, uh, people who insult religion, well, they shouldn't do it. I might agree that they shouldn't do it. Uh, but the idea that there should be a punishment for that, that's a much more widespread um, idea in the West. And Fleming Rose, the uh, culture editor of Yale and Poston, when it published the Danish cartoons in 2005, himself said over a year ago, they, and they is the ones who want to replace blasphemers, usually radicals, they have won. It is no longer possible to publish things like that. 
and in the West, our new, most of our newspapers, um, our TV programs, you know, the Comedy Central, South Park, uh, were censored um, over this, that uh, people will no longer publish things which might be a threat to them. Next. So in, in conclusion, um, as the late Abdulham Wahid said, Wahid was a former, oh, no, back, back one, um, was the former president of uh, Indonesia and former head of Nadatul Ulama, the world's largest Muslim organization, a very great man. Uh, he argued, and this, if I may go back to the book Blasphemy, which I mentioned earlier, Wahid actually wrote the foreword uh, to that book. And, um, and uh, the foreword is called God Needs No Defense. And there he says that coercively applied blasphemy laws narrow the bounds of acceptable discourse, not only about religion, narrowly understood, but also about vast spheres of life, of literature, of science, and of culture in general. It's not a narrow religious thing of someone who publishes a cartoon or says they're going to burn a Quran. It affects a whole discourse in major parts of the world. Next and last. My own conclusion, we need to resist such restrictions. When politics and religion are necessarily intertwined, as they uh, are intertwined, as they necessarily are in debates about blasphemy, then unless we allow real religious debate and criticism, you can have no real political debate. If you don't allow religious disagreement, it's very likely you will not allow any political disagreement. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. Um, so we can go to questions. Um, I see we have one question in the ch chat and feel free everyone to add your question in the chat or you can just raise your hand with the hand function and we can call on you. Um, but it looks like um, Barasa Annette, um, what, feel free to say your question. Oh, yeah, she's she or he is still on. Um, so they're asking, why was there no action or protests against Sweden, Swedish cartoons, and yet there were more, they were more offended. I'm sorry, I'm trying to reword the question a little bit. Okay. Why was there no action or protest against Sweden, um, the cartoons in Sweden, and yet they were more offended or more offensive than the Danish cartoons? I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's, um... In, in Pakistan, you may, if you're accused of blasphemy, a mob may attack you and there's in, instant violence. Um, but in other cases, such as the Swedish cartoons, uh, one reason is, I mean, there are death threats against um, the Swedish cartoons. That's true with Lars Vilks. Um, he had to live with protection for his life. So the sort of local things, radicals in Sweden were after him. Uh, but it didn't become a big issue, firstly, because newspapers stopped making it a big issue. And, um, and governments did not make an issue of it. Um, so, for example, going back to the Danish cartoons, the, um, uh, the, uh, at that point, several months after those cartoons came out, uh, Denmark was due to take the rotating presidency of NATO. And the Turks raised an objection to this, saying, you know, well, a country which allows these sorts of cartoons shouldn't be in NATO. And they pushed for concessions, which they've got. You know, they said, these are our principles and we'll stand on them. Except if you'll give us two other senior, extra senior jobs in NATO, we'll back off. So the Turks made that an issue. Other people uh, made it um, 
an issue. In the case of the Swedish cartoons, generally uh, they didn't. So that means in, in places where there may be riots in, in Nigeria, and um, which has had a major blasphemy case in the last few months, um, a, a person in Afghanistan or Pakistan isn't going to know what's in a Swedish newspaper unless someone tells them or makes a fuss about it. So these usually blow up when there's a, uh, some other major agenda. Also, to use another example, I, I, um, I mentioned the um, uh, American pastor, Terry Brooks, uh, a very small congregation consisting mainly of his family. Uh, but uh, the, uh, he threatened he was going to burn a Koran. And this became a major incident. The Secretary of State of the United States phoned him, the Secretary of Defense phoned him, the head of NATO, all these people, the vice president, were all appealing to him uh, not to do this. They made it a major international incident. So it's known all around the world. And there was a um, there was an outcry. Someone actually offered to buy him an SUV if he didn't burn the Quran, which would be rather stupid. In America, I was amazed. I thought, with that out, 10,000 people are going to threaten to burn a Quran, but say, but if you buy us an SUV, I won't. Uh, strangely, that never happened. But um, so again, a, a huge, huge incident. Um, in the end, that died down. He didn't burn a Koran then. A little known fact is two years later, he did. But it was largely ignored by the newspapers, carried on page P23, um, crazy pastor burns Koran. It never became an incident. So the, the coverage itself, uh, which treated this as a major issue, makes it a major issue were as if the uh, media had to treat it as a more minor issue, uh, then um, there's less of an outcry. So it's uh, how do the media treat it? Uh, how do governments treat it? That's a major reason for the difference in the response to the um, uh, Danish and Swedish cartoons or even the French cartoons. Um, okay, and Julia Bicknell has her hand up. So Julia, Hi. believe it or not, Paul, I'm actually just about to leave to go to the working group on apostasy and blasphemy laws um, of the Religious Liberty Partnership. But before I go, um, a couple of questions, if you don't mind. So one is, do you think that the people who are campaigning to get rid of apostasy laws and blasphemy laws around the world are actually wasting their time and energy what they should be doing is um making sure that they are applied fairly and particularly with one thing in mind which i've just noticed someone is trying to get going there are a number of times that the people um accused of blasphemy are often uh, have severe mental health conditions uh yes. so in other words do you think it's a waste of time to try to abolish these laws, but rather make sure they are um, applied with the right um, conditions. So that, yeah, let me let me keep it to that one. That 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 will be enough. Okay. For this. Um, it it depends on the country. Uh, the um, in you know Pakistan, we're just going to run into a brick wall. You know, with the Taliban, um, it's going to be a brick wall. Um, in those cases, uh, say with Pakistan, uh, the arm moves this way, of how can we sort of ameliorate uh, these laws? Uh, one of the suggestions is, which Pakistanis have taken seriously, is uh, have a penalty for a false accusation of blasphemy. Um, as you know, the... Um, uh, in very many of these cases, let's just focus on Pakistan. Um, 
you get a personal dispute between two people about a field or a cow and one accuses the other of blasphemy and they're killed, it's a threat, they're in prison. Um, but if you may be uh, accused and imprisoned yourself for making a false charge, I think that would cut it down. The other example you mentioned of people who um, have sort of mental problems, again, the um, to push um, for um, you know not applying the law in that case, as this has happened in Indonesia, there was a, a woman. Um, I mean, she took a dog into a mosque and various things, but she was um, she she had a lot of problems, and the uh, the government uh, refused to. You know, she was initially charged by the police, but the government did not pursue it. And they just said, she's not the exact word, but she's a crazy woman. I mean, she's uh, uh, not dealing with anything there. So um, so I, I think in Indonesia, for example, one can keep pushing the um, at the big religious freedom, at, let's see, was the religious freedom conference in Washington? Yeah, not the ministerial, the... Um, Indonesian Minister of uh, Law and Human Rights, who is in fact a Christian, um, you know, defended fairly mildly um, the blasphemy laws in uh, Indonesia, which are the protect harmony. Uh, as a government minister, he, he would have to or either resign. Um, but I think pressure on Indonesia um, uh, could get rid of that uh, those laws or, or change them fairly radically. Uh, the government is embarrassed uh, by them. Um, there are other things you can do in Indonesia. One is the um, Ulama Council, which is funded by the government, but it's not a government agency. Um, it's got more radical over the years. Uh, and it keeps you know throwing around accusations of blasphemy and defending it. Uh, the government needs to insist more, as Jokowi has. It says these are opinions by this council. This is not the law. And there was one case where uh, the Alama Council uh, had said various things, and the police were informing them. And the chief of police said, uh, "These are not laws. This is a, an opinion or advisory group." So. I think in, in Indonesia, um, making those things uh, clear, and I, th I think continual pressure on Indonesia can have an effect. In Pakistan, you're going to have to you know, follow the lines which um, uh, you outlined. Um, I think uh, pressure on the Egyptian government, again, to start minimizing those laws um, would be important. So uh, I think um, in many cases, uh, a strategy of you know, suffocation, if we can call it that, is probably the best one. Yeah, don't, don't, don't try and shoot them, suffocate them. I'm referring to the laws. But... Okay, thank you. Um, and Barasa has uh, one more question, I think. So, Grasa, you can ask your question. Okay, hi everyone. I really wanted to have a better understanding and I want to ask Dr. Marshall, maybe once a victim is accused falsely and identified, maybe in the long run, do they get compensated or what really happens? Um. I'm not sure of any cases where I know of someone being uh, compensated um, in the more, um, let's see. No, I don't. People have been acquitted, but often if they're acquitted, again, if, if you go to, you know, the example of Pakistan, you usually got to flee the country. If, uh, even if you're in fact found innocent, um, you have to flee. In Indonesia, that's not the case. I mentioned Ahok, 
Um, in fact, can, can, convicted of blasphemy, uh, served a sentence, and is now in the uh, uh, head of the National Oil Company, the, the uh, largest company in, in the country. So um, you might understand that as a sort of partial compensation. Um, but he hasn't had to flee. So uh, the penalties for um, the, the strength and power and penalties of the blasphemy laws will vary uh, tremendously. But I don't know of any case where someone has actually been uh, compensated. Um, no, I don't. Okay, now we have more questions in the chat. So one is from Amanda. She says, what can organizations Oh, sorry, Megan, it went, uh, you just like, oh, yeah. Sorry about that. You're, you're, okay, you let me, her, Megan. <laughs> so her question is, what can organizations like the Committee to Protect Journalists do either than just condemn acts and censorship arising from accusations of breaking blasphemy and religious reporting? Okay, so I think she's asking, um, what else can the Committee to Protect Journalists do than just condemn um, that I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, let me make a point that condemning these things is very important. Um, I, I'm, I've got to be careful here, so don't quote me, but I think it was Penn, uh, you know, which is you know, journalists and writers organization pushing for uh, um, freedom of the press. Um, got very waffly on this. Um, and you're finding a variety of journalistic organizations uh, actually not rushing to the defense and saying, well, you know, we shouldn't be insulting people. And you're getting these impress these words now, like uh, people are punching down. You know, it's, it, journalists should not be allowed to criticize anybody who's sort of of lower status than themselves. So if you have someone of Christian background who's criticizing a, a Islamic government or something, you're told you're punching down because Christians have high status, uh, higher than Muslims. And so you, you are getting organizations which were usually very strong on free speech. This includes, I'm using American examples, the American Civil Liberties Union, are now getting waffly on it. And uh, I think that's extremely dangerous. I think part of it is ignorance of the actual effect of blasphemy laws, because they think blasphemy laws are mainly focused on people who insult religion, which I think should be, it should be legal anyway, but as I've tried to show, most of these victims are not people who insult religion in any conventional sense. So one of the things I'm emphasizing for the Committee to Protect Journalists and others is actually raising, you know, raising these objections continually and don't get waffly uh, or vague or backtracking on freedom of speech and freedom of the press. And that itself uh, is important. Um, beyond that, um, what it could do when, when you in fact have a legal case, uh, well, another thing it could do is then uh, systematically um, point out the dangers of uh, blasphemy laws and similar laws throughout, throughout the world. So people understand uh, the full range of what is happening and its dangers. Uh, let, let me just go back. I, I mentioned earlier um, the uh, you know two groups. My first category, the sort of quote post-Islamic religions of uh, Baha'i and um, Ahmadiyya. Um, they are in you know, many parts of the world by their beliefs defined as blasphemers or apostates or heretics. Again, I'm using those terms interchangeably. With them, we're dealing with people in the millions, hundreds of thousands in Iran with the Baha'i, 
at millions in Pakistan with the Ahmadiyya. So uh, I think one thing the Committee to Protect Journalists do is point out the effects of this. The focus is journalists, so they need to start getting into the question of uh, Ahmadiyya, though there are Ahmadiyya journalists. Um, but to you know to point out the effect of these laws on um, debate um, generally, and um, so that would be one thing. Further than that, um, I'm not sure. Um, the um, also lobbying governments uh, directly about these issues, uh, perhaps uh, helping fund legal cases if there are places where legal cases exist. Uh, these would help, but um, I'm not sure. Maybe you have suggestions yourself about uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add, this is interesting um, when you're talking about that, Paul, because um, so I'm in a program right now at NYU's journalism school, and Salman Rushdie was supposed to teach a course this fall there. So his office is just empty, of course, right now. But NYU's um, journalism school, when they sent out the email about what happened, they actually didn't mention anything about him being stabbed um, or <laughs> they didn't mention very many details of the situation. And it was really kind of, uh, you know, just played out as like, well, he's not able to make it this fall, um, which I found very interesting because there was no, you know, acknowledgement that what had happened was a targeted uh, violence that had to do with, you know, his novel and the religious blasphemy laws. Anyway, that's a side point, but I just thought I would share that. That is amazing, actually. That is yeah. disturbing. <laughs> yeah. Catch COVID or something, you know? Um, right. yeah. yeah, it was, you know, of course everyone knew, knows from reading the news, but they, yeah, they were very hesitant to really talk about it in an email. Anyway, there's one more question. Um, yeah, may I just add, by the way, on this, um, I did um, send to Melissa um, links to three articles um, I did on blasphemy this year, uh, two of them in Religion Unplugged, one of them in uh, Providence, uh, two of which take off from um, ones on the Pew survey of blasphemy laws a while back, um, and two take off from the uh, what happened with Rushdie. They don't just focus on that, but use that as a lead to talk about some other things. So um, I, I, I'm not sure, but Melissa may be able to. Yes, I'm trying to forward them. I'm seeing if I can copy the link now. I'm having an issue with my computer freezing up, but I'll keep trying. If not, I will email it when we get off so people have it. Okay, thank you. So um, Megan, the question, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one question from Elias, um, what is the viability in American oh, frozen and or religion reporter? He's mentioning that, uh, I'm sorry, I keep freezing. Am I back? Let me to read it, Megan. I'll read it real quickly in case she's okay. freezing. Okay, um, what is the viability in American global newsrooms of the position of religion editor or religion reporter? In my newspaper, Daily Nation Kenya, we have several times opened up this position, but for some reason it got phased out. Do you see this as an important position in gatekeeping of sometimes sensitive and potentially explosive religious content? Um, boy, I've not... I'm not sure, uh, and probably uh, uh, someone like uh, Melissa or Megan would probably know uh, more about this than um, I do. But a, a few comments. Uh, um, I don't think the uh, well. You know, one thing is you know the number of religion reporters in the United States has been. Uh, dropping many newspapers have um, even before the current sort of financial pressure on the media um, many forms of media had been dropping their um, religion coverage and religion reporting 
I don't think it's because things are in, in, inflammatory. Um, I think it's a mindset which regards religion as not important. And so it gets dropped. I seem to remember that the Dallas Morning News had a used to have a major religion section, which was the most popular section of the newspaper, apparently, but it dropped it. Um, and that seems to be a sort of secular mindset that religion really doesn't lend itself to uh, to news. So it's it's a marginalization of religion as such. And uh, one of the goals of religion and unplugged, I mean, its focus is uh, by dealing with the religious aspects of major news stories is trying to show how religion is um, interwoven with so many of these stories. And you, you know, my most blunt statement is this, if you don't understand religion, you do not understand the modern world. If you don't understand religion, it's going to be hard for you to be a good journalist. Um, so, and I think it's that downplaying of religion um, which lies behind it. And of course, yeah, uh, again, uh, yeah, some form of media have gone the other way. Washington Post has, like the New York Times has, and, and um, I think uh, religion, specifically. Re religion reporters can be um, helpful to everybody else because you know you have another journalist who doesn't know much about religion but is writing a story uh, where religion is you know the subtext or a major part of the subtext and they're not aware of that and if you have uh, people around in the newsroom actually know something about religion that can be helpful to um, other reporters. Uh, the, uh, but uh, more, you know, so that that's, I, I think, a useful stopgap. But uh, more important is that also that the other journalists uh, learn, learn that religion is important to their own, own beat. Um, so whether you're, if you're covering American elections, you know, the religious dimensions there are, um, uh, sort of very widespread and um, often very complex. And so people get that wrong. I know um, one feature, and again, the question period, I, I'm doing things from memory, which may not always be exact. So don't quote me unless you've uh, checked it out. But I seem to remember in, uh, you know, lots of stories about, uh, American evangelical Christians voting for Trump, which is certainly true. Uh, part of the subtext of that of people who were doing sort of serious polling analysis, it says, um, for people, for self-described evangelicals, the more they go to church, the less likely they were to vote for Trump. So Trump tended to get disproportionately votes from people who describe themselves as evangelical, but were not churchgoers. Interesting. Whereas people who went to church every week, I mean, Trump voters in there too, but much less likely. And then you think, yeah, what's going on there? That's what I mean about um, the, the, these um, stories often sort of much more complicated uh, than uh, we often think. So, so again, uh, after all this waffle, going, going back to the question, I think it's more a secular mindset that doesn't see religion as important, which has meant the cutting back of religion uh, reporters. Uh, such reporters have a role to play in educating uh, their fellow journalists. Um, but again, it's uh, journalists themselves should realize um, uh, be able to spot the religious undercurrents of uh, many of their stories. Thanks. Um, yeah, that, that's a really interesting question because, you know, you also don't want to be censoring yourself as a reporter on yeah, a lot of things that are happening that are just, they're explosive and you're reporting on them versus... Yeah you know, making a mistake that then becomes an explosion. <laughs> uh -huh. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. We have, is, yeah. Yeah. We have three other questions. Um, one is from Juliet from Kebabi University. She says, how are we supposed to report such blasphemy cases as journalists by not going against the journalistic codes of conduct, especially when writing articles for newspapers that are religious based? Mm. So, um, yeah. yeah, maybe she wants to provide more context for her question and I'll let her decide. Or you can go ahead, Paul, if you have thoughts. Okay. Um, sensitively, the, um, I'll give an example. The, um, the book I mentioned, Silenced, there is an Indonesian translation of that, which was never published. The, um, uh, it was going to get published by the sort of the major publisher in, in um, Indonesia, um, but they wanted some changes. And uh, the changes were this, this is, we think this is a responsible book, you're not being inflammatory and so on. Says our problem is when, if someone's accused of blasphemy, when you allude to what they're supposed to have done, that itself is sensitive, you know. I'm not repeating the blasphemy, but even an allusion to it, um, that could be sensitive. And we were uh, discussing this, and the whole problem was rendered moot when the Islamic Defenders uh, Front uh, threatened the publisher if it was coming out, so they just backed off uh, anyway, so we didn't have to solve that question. Uh, but it, it raised the question is, if you're alluding to a blasphemy case, how much can you say about what they were, what they did, or what they were accused of doing? Um, so you yourself don't get accused of, of blasphemy. Again, so much is context dependent. Yeah, you know, at the extreme, with the Taliban, you 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 can't raise the issue. Um, in Saudi Arabia, um, or or Pakistan, to dispute whether or not they blasphemed could get you into trouble itself. Uh, but in, in other settings, um, I, I think you would probably need to allude to the fact that uh, someone had been accused of uh, uh, blasphemy for certain things they had said about um, Islam's prophet Muhammad or about the Quran or about something else. So you'd have a formulation for you know, certain things they have said. I think that's probably enough without destroying journalist integrity, but without getting yourself uh, into problems. So I had another thought on that too. But uh, yeah, if, the, if that's what you're driving at as the question, um, I think certain things, it's quite all right to leave them vague. Great, and one question from David from Uganda. He's asking, do you agree with the thesis that journalists should stay away from controversies in religion to not provoke retribution and accusations of blasphemy? I think he's frozen. I know, I was trying to figure out if who's frozen. I'm like, maybe I'm frozen. Okay, my frozen. Frozen. <laughs> it's not Did me. you get the question? <clears throat> so I'm, I'm just saying, I, mean, I think journalists have to deal with controversy, things which are not controversial and not usually newsworthy. Um, well, that's not true. The weather and things like that uh, is also news. But um, the... Um, I, as a journalist, usually I don't think it's your problem to sort of try and solve that controversy. Um, but on, on the, the uh, straight news front, simply as much as you can to report it. And um, 
say um, what the two sides or maybe the three uh, three or four sides we need to be careful about not saying you know there are two sides to question there may be maybe many more um various dimensions of it but um, i think to report that controversy and um an example which, which sort of came up um, in discussions about church state questions, the United States amongst journalists it says, um, uh, you know, how do we deal with this without taking sides? And the answer was, well, report the controversy, re report the dispute. And um, I think that sort of thing is um, um, important. Um, and journalists should should do it again uh, try to avoid being inflammatory or um, offering a simple so solution to what is a um, a very complex question um, on a um, a matter which, which, which you say very important to muslims um about you know when do you say that uh, ramadan begins uh, there are different ways of measuring that, and uh, countries come in, in, in different ways. And um, you're looking at questions of, um, you know, when, do, when does fasting begin? Well, it begins at sunset. Uh, that's usually fairly easy if you're living in Sudan or Nigeria or, or Algeria. Uh, but if you happen to be living in Sweden, especially northern Sweden, you know, what do you do when the sun actually doesn't set for a couple of weeks? How do you deal with that? So these are, I, I think, sort of uh, questions within the religion, which, which can be controversial. Uh, and I, I wouldn't try and solve that question. Um, you know, but those, those can be interesting things to uh, report. Um, you know, how do you... How do you uh, how would you start fasting on Ramadan when the sun doesn't set for uh, for weeks? And um, how do people? I don't know if I've seen a story on that, uh, but yeah, how, how do people um, approach this question? So, so yeah, uh, sensitive. Try and cover most of the sides, but um, uh, get into these controversies, especially so that uh, I think more secular people. Um, understand what's going on, that there are often very real issues here. So. Thanks. Um, and then Dr. Rosemary Kowar, I'm sorry if I'm saying your last name incorrectly. Um, she's asking, it, she's, she's writing, in my opinion, the position of religion editor is crucial in a newsroom. Why? Such a person would go out of their way to understand religion and would help ensure sensitivity in reporting. Okay, now I realize. I'm sorry. I thought you had a question, yes, <laughs> but it's um, but it's uh, well received. Yeah, She's right, you know, the position of religion editor goes out of their way to understand religion and helps ensure that sensitivity in reporting. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting to to think about how right, right, yeah. editors and journalists can be. Um, you know, I guess I would don't know if I would use a gatekeeper like Elias said, but kind of ensure that sensitivity in reporting. But you know, at the end of the day, you do have to report on those controversies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I think too, Megan, the um, with the the media project, really the foundation of what we do is because of this. Um, Roberta, who is the founder of our organization, was a religion reporter and recognized the need for journalists, to your point, Dr. Marshall, that journalists are aware of religion, whatever their beat is, um, so that sensitivity is there. But Rosemary, that's exactly why we exist. And so we agree wholeheartedly. And that's part of um, what we hope to do here through these events and through our in-person gatherings uh, is really to educate and equip journalists to be able to cover religion and then through Religion Unplugged, having opportunities to be able to produce work um, that we can highlight if you're not able to in your own publication. But anyway, we just say amen. We agree wholeheartedly. That's what um, really brought this organization about in the first place. Yeah, that, that's true. Uh, Roberta, who's the chairman of the board, um, you know, 
a favorite example is she was a uh, religion reporter, religion editor of the Orange County Register a newspaper in California, and uh, when Indira Gandhi was killed. And um, she was killed by one of her Sikh bodyguards who had a grievance against it. Uh, so nobody in the regular newsroom knew what to make of that. So as a religion reporter, she knew what a Sikh was. She knew where to find Sikh in Orange County and phone them and get a reaction. So here, major news story, you know, the assassination of the, uh, the leader of the second most populous country in the world. And uh, you needed a religion reporter's input to understand what was going on here because other people tended not to know. Uh, if I may, may add an example, um, several years back, um, I was um, brought in to lead a couple of seminars for uh, uh, Radio Liberty, Radio Free Europe. Uh, that, those are American government funded uh, bodies originally uh, reaching out to uh, Eastern Europe, they still do, uh, but parts of the greater uh, Middle East and wanting to play the news straight. Uh, uh, the goal was not to be a propaganda outlet, um, but uh, to try and give straight news in areas which weren't getting very much of it. So uh, I was to uh, lead a couple of seminars for the staff on um, religion and the news. And the night before my, my seminars, I was having the um, having dinner with the director of uh, Radio Free Europe. This is in the in Prague in the Czech Republic. And um, he said to me, he says, a lot of our journalists here are terrified of the sessions tomorrow. I said, like, like why? Um, he said, well, they think you, you're going to try and tell them they all have to be in Bible studies or something. He said, no. He said, he said I, Jeff Gedman, uh, he said, I've, I've got them otherwise. He says, the people who aren't in the least worried are the Muslims, because we have a service we have a Farsi service reaching out to Iran. We have other things going to Afghanistan and so on. And for them, this is basically old news, you know, as I said, you know. So if you want to un understand, um, you know, many of these countries, you've got to understand the religion, you know, and for the, for the Iranians, this was like, well, yeah, duh. Who doesn't know that? <laughs> the, the, the sort of, well, apparently a lot of the colleagues. It was, it was just very interesting that um, they they were quite happy with this and they already knew that. Simply because if you're Iranian, if you don't, unless you understand something about Shiism, you don't understand Iranian politics and, and whatever. So again, it was um, <clears throat> in this case, it was the. Uh, Muslim journalists, or journalists from Muslim countries who were uh, uh, also seeking to help educate their uh, their fellow journalists that, um, no, you don't have to go to a Bible study, but, you know, if, if you want, want to understand Iranian foreign policy, you'd better understand Shiism, so. Mika might be frozen. Yes, I sorry. I'm back. <laughs> I do see um, Barasa has her hand raised. So if we have time, we can do one more question. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, Dr. Marshall for that amazing presentation. And uh, maybe um, once more, I'm Barasa Anet uh, from Kibabi University, a journalist student. So my question is, what measures and responsibilities can the press take in order to allow it to cover these issues and controversies fairly and seriously uh, through assessing the risks and preparing reporters for the front lines and the red lines, bearing in mind that the important part of being a journalist is to be able to use skills to tell the people that religion should be used as a harmonizing factor rather than a dividing factor. Thank you. Um, 
the oof, I, again, uh, I've said this before. Um, a lot of this is sort of um, very context dependent. Um, the situation of you know, a journalist in the United States um, is very different from that of a journalist in Egypt, but also true that uh, the situation of a journalist in Indonesia um, or Malaysia is very different from that in, um, in, in, in Egypt. Uh, or again in Central Asia, the um, again I would say that uh, firstly you need to yeah if there is something going on if there are differences if there are conflicts uh, to understand um, you know, what is happening in the background because they can be. Uh, often more complex than um, we realize. Uh, secondly, to um, try and portray what it is that the various people involved in something controversial, uh, what they are um, in fact uh, about. And um, I'm not sure I would say in your reporting, you're, you're pushing that religion should be um, uh, leaning towards harmony. Um, but you're, I would rather say, but your reporting should not be a source of disharmony uh, as much as you can avoid it. Um, in, in some cases you can't, simply reporting the news is gonna upset some people. So uh, the case in, in uh, Nigeria, uh, where that uh, student was killed over supposed uh, blasphemy. Uh, you know, people who were reporting that and making a fuss about it um, were themselves uh, threatened. And um, I, I'm not sure what you can do then um, other than not report it. Uh, but I think in that case, it, it needed to report, be reported. I don't think threats were were carried out. Um, but to explain, uh, get the issue right, explain its um, sensitivities, and do not become yourself a, a source of um, uh, division. Um, it's not your job to make everybody harmonious, but I think it's part of your job not to cause disharmony when you can possibly avoid it. <laughs>